Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This is episode 219. And this week, we are welcoming another brand new novelist, first-time novelist to the show, by the name of Diane Cohen Schneider. Diane's first book, titled Andrea Hoffman Goes All In, has been described as Devil Wears Prada meets Wall Street. And as if that's not cool enough, uh, you're going to find out from the interview portion of it, to kind of play on words a little bit, Diane has a wealthy background in Wall Street. And we're going to hear all about that and how her knowledge in Wall Street and money and everything, how that came into her writing uh, with the main character and all these stories and uh, so much of it that was based on her own experiences, uh, her learning about that life. Uh, We're talking about finding the real beginning to our novels, which (laughs) was, was a unique thing. I don't think that's ever come up on the show before. But that was uh, that was unique and, and uh, very interesting to discuss. Uh, writing at the library, and uh, you know, not only just because it's a nice place to go, but also it's if you don't go somewhere else to do your writing, you're going to get stuck doing something else. And you know what? I can relate to that. I can relate to that. And we're also talking to Diane about why she based this story in the '80s. So much goodness in this interview. Uh, We're going to have some laughs, and uh, you're going to really find so much of this interesting. So if you like Wolf of Wall Street, if you like the classic Wall Street, I even got a little little whiff of uh, Secret of My Success uh, in this, uh, the reading and then talking to Diane. It just kind of, so much of this 80s vibe really came back to me, and it's it's a really good time. You're going to enjoy this, so stay tuned. To my interview with Diane Cohen Schneider. It's coming up here in just a few moments. Meanwhile, uh, today is August 2nd, and that is just blowing me away. I cannot believe more than half the year is now gone. And holy cow, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but the year is not quite what I thought it would be. <laughs> um, writing wise, I thought I would be well into my third book by now, uh, with Bandit 2 already out. That was the plan, and I'd be, you know, close to being done with Bandit 3 by now, and I was going to try and get a third book out this year. Right now, I don't know what's... I'm not sure exactly uh, what my schedule is going to be writing-wise, but, uh, you know, I I had a lot of big plans earlier this year, and uh, it's like real quick... The uh, 2022 said, no, you're not doing that because here's this issue and here's that issue. And, you know, I mean, uh, the show has has picked up on some of this, too, that, you know, I have not put out as many episodes this year as I have in the past just because I've had to take a lot of time away uh, periodically. So it's been an interesting year. And considering that we've been through a pandemic and uh, really so much of that didn't really slow the show down. And uh, it didn't slow my writing down. It's uh, I guess it's some of that stuff just finally caught up, and <laughs> it's uh, it's been a little crazy, you know. Uh, but you know, on the bright side, though, I mean, you, you can't get me down. Um, it's not nothing's going to knock me down for long. I'm I am excited about the direction that Bandit Two is going. As I said in the last episode, whenever I do sit down and write, I'm getting some good words in. I'm getting more than a thousand words every time I sit down to write. I'm in that mode now, like I've passed the halfway point, so everything's starting to come to me quicker, and I'm going like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, this is this. And uh, during the day when I'm at work, it's in my mind a whole lot too, so I'm fixing things and realizing, like, i got to you know, make a note, oh crap, yeah, i got to go back and fix this thing earlier in the story, because I just remembered, I think I wrote this instead of that. So it's, it's an interesting process, how that's all going. Meanwhile, I, uh, I've been invited to join an anthology so I, I actually took a couple of days away from bandit 2 to explore that idea and uh, i did come up with an idea for a short story um, it doesn't have to be very long it can be it's you know it's five thousand words maximum so depending on you know when i do this i could knock it out pretty quick uh, but it's it's really cool it's it's a, a small town story kind of idea 
but it's with a twist. It's all the stories are like, you know, mysteries and, uh, you know, the urban legend kind of stuff about a small town. And, you know, that's right up my alley. I love that kind of stuff. That was what my first novel was all about, was an, a local urban legend. So I I love it. Um, I'm going to be working on that here pretty quick. I'm going to take a little break. Once I have a whole story mapped out of what I want to do with it, then I'm going to sit down and uh, work on that and put Bandit 2 aside for just a little while and uh, see how that goes. Uh, and then that's supposed to come out in October is when that anthology comes out. So once I know more, uh, have more information for you, I'll be sure to let you know. Of course, as always, and this is a segue, by the way, <laughs> as always, I do all of that writing on my favorite writing software, Scrivener. Uh, it's a blast because, uh, you know, one of the, here, another thing I love about Scrivener, let me just say that, is my short story idea that I have is going to tie into a potential novel, future novel idea that I have. So, I and I've got the notes, I've got the characters all mapped out for that story because I've started some of it like two years ago and then set it aside. And, uh, you know, Scrivener makes it so easy because I can pull up that story. Here's my notes, here's my character information. I can move over to this new short story, the information that I need so that I have it available. And I can have both stories pulled up in my windows it is amazing. Scrivener is incredible, all the things it can do. Check out this advertisement for how you can save 20% on the regular desktop version. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. Okay, thank you once again to Scrivener. Uh, much obliged for everything you've done with the show. And uh, looking forward to uh, setting some things up and uh, sticking around with them for the future. I also want to thank Writer's Block Coffee. They are an affiliate of the show, meaning if you like what I'm about to describe and you're interested in trying out the Writer's Block Coffee, you can click the link in the show notes uh, or go directly to writersblockcoffee.com and then use coupon code SAMPLECHAPTER. We get a little portion of, uh, of the order, comes to help out the show, uh, you know, pays for our website and uh, any other information, you know, any other little things. Uh, that we need. But Writer's Block Coffee has three delicious flavors. There's their signature, Writer's Block Blend, which is very good, by the way. I, I got their samples of that a while back. Uh, or, well, when I first started off with this earlier this year, I got a sample of that uh, and then ordered a bag of it later on. There is also my personal favorite, the Whiskey Barrel Aged Blend. And that is just delightful. It's got such a good aroma. I, I, I enjoy just sitting there with the cup and smelling it as much as I do drink it. <laughs> so it's very good. Uh, and then finally they have the deadline dark, which is fantastic when you've been up late. Uh, like I'm sure I'm going to be here sometime soon working on my stories, trying to reach my own personal deadlines. And now I've got to get up and go to work. So deadline dark, dark is sure to, uh, give you that little extra kick in the butt when you got to get up and get moving. Hey, check out one, check out them all order one time or set it up on automatic shipment. It's all available. Each of those options are available to you right there in the show notes at writersblockcoffee.com. Finally, I want to thank my friends over at pop goes the culture network home to about a dozen other amazing and incredibly entertaining shows all of them pop culture related. So if you like comic book news, if you like movie news, celebrity gossip, if you're into sci-fi, if you're into movie reviews, all kinds of stuff, it's all available right there. Uh, you follow the link in the show notes for popgoesaculture.com. And uh, you can even find our show listed in there. 
so lots of good things. Uh, their flagship show, Pop Goes the Culture Podcast, just recently changed their format. They're now coming out with uh, two or three smaller episodes throughout the week. Instead of one monster episode on Fridays, <clears throat> like they normally would, it's been like an hour and a half to sometimes two hours. And, you know, as a podcast listener myself, those get a little lengthy. That, that, that's a commitment to listen to a show that long. Uh, so they've changed it up, and uh, I think that's pretty cool. I'm really enjoying the new format, and uh, now you can catch them in smaller segments throughout the week. So anyway, that's my two cents. I think it's really cool, and uh, click that link in the show notes to find all of those amazing shows. Well, I've already talked longer than I normally would, so without further ado, let's get on over to our interview with the wonderful Diane Cohen Schneider. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Welcome back. Today, we have a wonderful story to bring to you from debut novelist Diane Cohen Schneider. Diane grew up in Illinois, but spent most of her adult life in Stanford, Connecticut with her husband and three children. Her career as a finance sales executive during the 1980s inspired her debut novel, which has been described as Devil Wears Prada meets Wall Street. After leaving Wall Street, Diane continued her love of finance Believing everyone should have basic financial literary skills, she has taught courses and workshops, and because she feels money management is not only necessary but fun, she has an Instagram account called Money Like a Mother. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the show, Diane Cohen Schneider. Thank you so much for having me. I am glad to have you here. I'm excited about this book. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I can't wait to uh, dive in. So uh, tell us a little bit about this, uh, this background working on uh, Wall Street. Well, I got a uh, degree in economics and then I went on and got an MBA. And like a lot of people still didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I answered an ad um, in the newspaper. And, you know, those were the days. Nowadays, you hear about kids and they've got, you know, six callbacks and it starts. I walked in the door. They went, yep, you'll you'll do. <laughs> I think I started on Monday. So um, it was 12 years during a really interesting time in the market. Um, for example, when I started, the average volume on the New York Stock Exchange was 12 million shares a day. Ooh. Now, 12 million shares trade a second. So um, things were, were very, very different. Um, not only that, that we could smoke in the office. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, things were different way back then, right? Oh, gosh. Yes. Oh, man. I remember that. I remember... I remember being in the theaters and you were smoke and restaurants and uh, just the little uh, I saw a picture online the other day of the back seat of the car. They had the little ashtray built into it. That's right. I was like, oh, I remember those. Yep. <laughs> just, and, and they were always full of uh, chewed up gum. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what um, what got you into into writing uh, from a career on Wall Street to writing? How did that happen? Yep. There was there was kind of a gap in between. I wasn't one of those um, people that knew they wanted to be a writer from age five who was, you know, making picture books and that kind of thing. Um, My mother was a librarian, so I was always a big, big reader. Um, And when I was in a boring meeting, when I was working, I might jot down some notes about, you know, funny phrases people used or what things looked like. And when I retired, I just threw them in a box. And then in uh, 2008, the book and the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street came out. And all of a sudden, all these people were like super interested um, in the Wall Street of the 80s. And I thought, huh, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it didn't look like it didn't look like that for me. So I thought, well, maybe there's, there's a story here that's different that I could tell. So that's, that's what got me started writing. Wow. Okay. Now, did you, did you start then around 2008 or did it take a little while to kind of stew? Well, it took a little while because first I had to teach myself how to write a book. (laughs) (laughs) 
then being the daughter of a librarian, I went to the library and I found like two books. One was by Nabokov and the other one was by John Gardner. And I read them both and I had no clue (laughs) how to start still. So I found what everyone who's, I think, a a hopeful writer should read, which is Stephen King's book on writing, Mm, which is really, really good. Um, I also found another masterpiece called How Not to Write a Shitty Novel. (laughs) Um, That one was very helpful. Um, And, you know, by doing that, I I was able to get through in in a couple of years a first draft. Um, Then I got a little bit more serious and I started taking workshops and that kind of thing. So. Okay. All right. So when you, uh, when you first started developing the idea, what was uh, like, how did the character come to you? How did you start developing that character? Well, a lot of that character is things that happened to me. Um, I like to say that anything really clever and successful she did is is from real life and anything stupid she does, I had to make up. (laughs) Um, But the interesting thing was, is that the second to the last chapter of the book is how I started. Um, I thought that was going to be the beginning. But because people know so little kind of about the stock market and things. Mm-hmm. Now, how the heck am I going to explain this to people without just lecturing? So I thought, well, if I start when she doesn't know anything and she learns, mm-hmm. then my readers can learn with me. So yeah, it's kind of how I learned to, to structure it. Isn't that interesting how uh, much the same way with my first book, I had this grand idea for how I would open it up with a big scene and lots happening and only to realize later on, Oh, I just wrote the ending. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is good to have. Right. It's like, yay, I know. how this one's Yeah. Going. Yeah. <laughs> it, it still changed a lot, but yeah, later on I was, I, same thing. I, I ended up joining a, a writing group and I was reading it to them and they were like, I'm not sure how we know any of this ahead of time. And like, how did you introduce this and how to, with us, you know, as a reader, how would they know what's happening here? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, okay. And it's like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta be able to show us this before without telling, just telling and whatever. And I thought, okay, all right, well, that's interesting. And uh, it, it's uh, always fascinating to see how that structure comes through and, and we're learning as we go, right? Uh, especially on that first book. <laughs> yes. Killed a lot of trees, <laughs> <laughs> printing out those drafts, but Um, I think it's um, the thing about finance is that, you know, even if you are not in law enforcement or a lawyer or a criminal, uh, if I asked you right now to read me my rights, you could do it, right? Mm. You know, you have the right to, I mean, because you heard it a million times. Yeah. There's very rarely a TV show where the person says, oh, I'll be back later because I have to go to the bank and renew my CD because my interest rates are up six basis points. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they just don't have that kind of familiarity. And, and that was the biggest um, feedback that I got when I tried to go the agenting route, which is basically, Jesus, finance is too boring. I don't, you know, can you make, can you make your, your protagonist have a different job? Mm -hmm. Uh, No. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You, you uh, stuck with the adage of writing what you know, essentially. Yes. absolutely. Well, how about uh, any, uh, did you develop any kind of like writing quirks as you were uh, putting this together? Uh, besides coffee, <laughs> <laughs> I see. I saw on your website we might share that, that yeah. <laughs> writing thing. I actually um, am a library writer, so oh. in 2008, it just so happened that my husband retired from Wall Street, and he had been a commuter, and he'd leave at you know seven in the morning and get home at seven at night, and I had the house to myself. And then he came home and started um, a business in the house. (laughs) And that's when I discovered my local library. And um, so I would go every day, pretty much try to go every day from like nine to one. Oh, Um, nice. 
Yeah, that, that worked that worked out for me. So so was that like in a private room at the library or just at one of the open tables? Yeah, and no, for me it kind of worked to be out in the open, although um libraries ch have changed a lot, right? They're not quiet anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> headphones and maybe some um noise canceling had, you know. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, sometimes that that had to work. I can't listen to music um, while I write. I know a lot of people do. Do you do that? I, I'm back and forth a little bit. Some because sometimes I'll be. Uh, one of my quirks is I've learned I can write just about anywhere. So I can be, I can open up the laptop and be in the living room while my wife's watching TV, and oh, wow. it's just playing in the background, and I'll be sitting there laughing at myself over something <laughs> a character has said. That's um, good. Uh, but uh, I'll play some music sometimes. It, it depends on what I'm writing. Yes. Um, I'll I'll use it as inspiration, depending on what I'm I'm doing with it. So I had a have a series I'm working on that originates in the '80s and it's science fiction. And so the main character listens to a lot of the classic '80 hits. Uh -huh. And so during certain action scenes, I'm playing like an '80s playlist in my head so that way it's like okay yeah so trying to get the pacing down and doing that but yes. otherwise and i it doesn't seem to bother me too much if, if something's bothering me i'll put on headphones yeah. and pretend like i'm listening to something and it's just to quiet everything else down a little bit sounds good but uh yeah i i've i've gone to the library a few times that's been nice to just open up a table sit down somewhere um during the pandemic I would get nice long lunch breaks um, and I wanted to get away from the office, but I couldn't go in the library because it was closed, yeah, no. but the Wi-Fi was still on. So I could, oh. I could pull up in my car and I bought one of those little, um, oh, it's a travel desk that attaches to my uh, steering wheel. Oh, that's awesome. And then I have my tablet and a little portable yeah. keyboard and I would connect to their Wi-Fi in the parking lot and, I could just kind of sit there and if it was cool outside, it was great. But yeah. in the summer months, it wasn't as nice because it's uh, <laughs> a little warm in there. <clears throat> but uh, yeah. but that worked out. That was actually kind of nice. I I wrote a few chapters that way. Good. So, <laughs> so uh, what uh, what does your family think of uh, of the the new career? You know, I have to. I have to tell you that um, my husband is not a big um, fiction reader and uh, he is a little hesitant <laughs> <laughs> to read this book. I keep assuring him he's, he's not in it, um, but um, I have three kids and um, they are they are super thrilled. Um, and that's been really one of the big reasons why I wanted to get um, that out there. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, I don't know, be before I started work on this seriously, I was watching TV and it, it could have been Clinton. It, it could have been one of the other presidents. I don't remember. But he was up there giving a speech and his mom was in the audience and she was just beaming and clapping and I thought, wow, isn't that awesome to sit there and watch your kids? And then mm. I thought, screw it. Let them sit in the audience and watch me <laughs> first, right? I yeah. mean, my turn first. That's right. So anyway, that, that kind of spurred me to, to get this done. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, they've, they've, all, they've all been great. So. Well, good, good. I, I've said a hundred times on the show at least, it, for me, it was uh, when I found out the first time I was going to be a grandpa, oh. that's what got that uh, kick in the butt. Like, oh, man, I'm I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be an author by now and, and have this career and like, OK, time to get serious and start making the time to write. <clears throat> right. That's really the key, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. super easy to find something else to do. Um, and that's why I had to go to the library because it was always the plumber was coming or, you know, uh, this was yeah. happening or that was happening. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, if you're really serious, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get the heck out of the house. So. <laughs> I heard somebody recently said, if you want to get your house clean and you're an author, then uh, give them a deadline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow, that's, that's true. So, <laughs> so uh, Going back to your story, you you based this in the 80s. Was that a conscious decision to make it in the 80s as opposed to something today? 
Yes. I mean, the business has completely changed. My job was called institutional equity salesman, which is quite a mouthful. But what it means is that I would call up professional money managers. So that would be an insurance company, a bank, a money manager, that kind of person. And I would tell them what our what our company thought they should buy or sell at any given time. Um, I also, there was a lot of relationship management, you know, going Mm -hmm. to Bulls games and hockey games and taking (laughs) dinner and that kind of thing. Um, But then just about the time I retired, uh, you know, everything went online. They didn't need me to call them up and tell them anything that day. They could just, you know, go online and see what we had to say. So that job doesn't exist anymore. And, and it's, you know, so this was, I mean, a few more years and this will be classified as a historical novel. I think you, yeah, got to be 50 years in the past. We're not there yet. Um, but yeah, it, it really was a picture of, of a time in this country that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's a, um, it's been interesting watching some of those jobs that were such a staple for so long, seeing them kind of go away. And I hadn't thought about um, that aspect of wall street and such, but like uh, our local paper uh, oh, yeah. has been falling back and falling back. And it was, you know, an everyday occurrence, you go get the paper every day. And then now it's, it's uh, twice a week. And I think they're looking mm-hmm. at maybe once a week here soon. And, it's just uh, in the phone book. Yes. <laughs> <You used> to... <laughs> oh my gosh. Just all these things that uh, you used to, I mean, you had to have your phone book and now it's right. nobody uses them anymore. And they're so thin. They're like a magazine now. That's right. You know, and speaking of magazines, I was doing a little research recently and I wanted some magazines. They don't, very few of them exist anymore. It's yeah. unbelievable how that business has really shrunk. That's true. Yeah. Last time I was in the bookstore, I was looking through the magazine rack trying to find, oh, where's this magazine I used to read on writing or fitness or something else. And it's, it's hard to find yeah. some of them anymore. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> so what's, uh, what's next for you? Do you have a sequel in mind or a, a, a different book? Yeah, I actually, like probably everybody else, have like three manuscripts in various stages. <laughs> um, and the decision is, is which one uh, is going gonna, is gonna to get my full attention. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have a, a book that I had worked on previously, but the um, heroine had a 9-11 backstory. Mm-hmm. And so now she'd be like 40. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately there is not a, a lack of tragedies in this country that i can update but yeah this one is going to require some updating that's a story that that i really like um it's kind of about how this country uh you know worships famous people and oh yeah so yeah and it's always interesting um with famous people too it's that that there's that worship like you said and there's also that familiarity where we feel like we know them yeah. and it, it and you're just so willing to run up and say hi and talk about yeah. talk to them as if that you've known them all their lives and they're looking at back at us like hi <laughs> yes i actually i i was walking on the street in new york and woody allen and uh so Yi were walking in front of me and I had that exact like, oh, reaction until I realized, no, you don't really know them. Yeah. <laughs> Leave them alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's great. Well, uh, <clears throat> so uh, see, so the book comes out August 30th. It is available right now for pre-order and it's already got a lot of uh, wonderful praise and uh, just rave reviews already building up for it. It's getting exciting. Uh, do you have like a big party in mind? Anything, uh, any kind of a big launch thing going on on the 30th? I, not on the 30th. I am going to go back to Connecticut um, in mid-September and I'm going to do an event in the library where I wrote most of it. So <laughs> nice. Really I'm really looking forward to that. 
I mean, I think one of the one of the fun things is I've started to get those those emails coming in on my website, you know. Yeah. Hey, it's been 20 years, you know. <laughs> really great to re reconnect with people. Fantastic. Oh, that'll be that'll be fun. We'll have to uh, yeah. look forward to that. So speaking of, where can people find and follow you? Uh, I do have a website, which is just diancohenschneider.com. Um, I also have a Facebook author page, which is Diane Cohen author. Boy, not really very creative, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and this just the simplest way to do it. So I, that's right. Oh, and of course, uh, on Twitter at Money Like a Mother. So <laughs> I have a I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun with that. So that sounds like a lot of fun. So fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a blast and uh, I, mean, I can't wait to uh, check this book out and uh, to read all about these adventures. It sounds, it's going to take me back. I know for sure. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was, I was thinking about making an eighties playlist to put on my <laughs> website. Cause yeah, that's a big part of, uh, of Andrea's life too. She, she talks about her least favorite rock songs ever. <laughs> which would be Rock the Casbah and Squeeze Box. Do you have the oh. least favorite? Um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I always love Rock the Casbah. <laughs> I think that might be a, like a male-female thing. Uh, a you know, guilty. I like to mostly be too. Yeah, know. it's a guilty favorite. It's like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I like it, yeah. <laughs> That was a, that was one. If it came on while you were cruising, you had to roll down the windows and blast it just to kind of yeah. like, yeah, yell it out the window. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you once again. Uh, is there anything we need to set up for this uh, sample that we're going to hear? I don't think so. Um, this is actually the fourth chapter. Andrea has has uh, been involved in a robbery at her previous job, and that convinces her um, that she needs to, to move on. And she picks a, a, a ad out of the paper, and this is her going in for her interview. All right. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, time for me to step aside with my writer's block coffee and hand the floor to our guest, Diane Cohen Schneider with Andrea Hoffman goes all in. I get off the number 36 bus, walk a block south, and spin through the enormous revolving door of a contemporary glass and steel office building. Looking good, feeling confident, dressed in a calf-length black skirt and beige turtleneck sweater. I smile at my reflection in the polished chrome elevator doors as I wait for them to take me up to the 17th floor and Mosley Securities a place where I could use my brains is what Sam said and kept saying glass after glass of free wine. The middle-aged receptionist is friendly, hands me an application and a pen and ushers me into a small conference room. After a long 10 minutes, a tall man with thick white hair, a hawk nose and standard issue wasp blue eyes strides in. He's dressed in a sharp dark blue suit and a conservative tie. I jump up and shake his hand. I'm smiling. He's stopped. My throat tightens and I resist the urge to pull at the neck of my sweater. Suddenly, I've lost my confidence that I'm in the right place. Harold Stackman, sit please. He scans my completed application, lets out a sigh and mutters, is reading really a hobby? He puts down the paper and looks directly at me. Philosophy major? Impressive school, too. So, Andrea Hoffman, do you know anything about the economy? I had a year of economics in college, my sophomore year, a semester of micro, and a semester of macro. Why did a philosophy major take economics? I studied, well, actually, I fell in love with Ralph Waldo Emerson freshman year. And Emerson said, money is in its effects and laws as beautiful as roses. I had always thought money was, you know, the root of all evil. So I took some economics classes to help me understood what he meant. The correct quote is, the love of money is the root of all evil. Whether that happens to be accurate, we really don't have time to debate. 
Just tell me if you know anything about the U.S. economy right now. It's no bed of roses, I say. Mr. Stackman smiles faintly, puffs on his cigar. I realize he's waiting for an answer. A small nervous laugh escapes, although I know this is serious stuff. People are really hurting. Interest rates are high, inflation rates are high, and so is unemployment. High unemployment and high inflation at the same time is unusual. They call it stagflation and well, it's bad. How do you know this? I read the newspaper. Which paper? The Chicago Tribune. Ah, the Trib's crap. Read the Wall Street Journal every day. And Sunday, get the New York Times. Still, not a dreadful summary of the state of things for a philosophy major who's been working in a dress shop. Why were you working there? Did Emerson have anything to say about retail? Emerson had his guide to prosperity. People think he was totally against materialism, but he was interested in personal economics, so retail isn't that much of a stretch. I can tell from Mr. Stackman's face he didn't expect an answer that involved more philosophy. I regroup. But mostly I was there because I knew the owner. I had sales experience and I needed a job. I have student loans to pay back. I leave out a few details, like I didn't have any money to go to graduate school and didn't know what I would have studied there anyway, and that I was totally burned out by the last semester of my senior year and seriously depressed that my ex-boyfriend had a new girlfriend and obviously didn't want me to stay in Boston. Mr. Stackman is giving his cigar a good workout, but I sense he's listening. Are you good at it, selling dresses? I guess so. He checks his watch. You guess so. D plus answer. I could have said I was the store's best salesperson, being that I was the only one besides Mariana who worked there. I could have said I could sell crack to Jimmy Carter. When I try to think of a cleverer answer to that last question, he asks me another one. I haven't been listening. Got any theories? Theories? How do we fix the mess the economy is in now? Ah, so much for this job being perfect for me. Apparently, I'm not smart enough for this. I hadn't realized a sales assistant would be responsible for economic policy decisions. The first year of economics only introduces problems to come up with some solutions. Pretty sure I would need at least another year. I think Mr. Stackman nods just a little bit. Fair enough. What do you know about the stock market? It's time to close this sale. It's taken a huge drop in the last six months, I say, and try and look concerned. Sorry, don't be. We make money either way. Do you know anything else? Buy low, sell high, I offer. That wisdom came from my grandpa, Sam, who loved studying the stock market, even though he didn't have any real money to invest in it. I try to stop my leg from shaking under the desk. Mr. Stackman seems to be waiting, and when I don't elaborate, he says, well, you don't know much, but at least what you know isn't wrong. What's the difference between a stock and a bond? A bond is a debt, and stock is ownership. Ha! Got one. What did they tell you this job pays? Nothing. Well, it pays more than nothing, Mr. Stackman relights a cigar with a gold monogram lighter. No, I stammer. They told me nothing. The salary wasn't listed in the ad. The job pays 22 grand a year. He watches me closely. I try for my best poker face. At the store, I was making 14.5. $22,000 is the kind of money adults make. I could stop buying Suave Shampoo and the store brand mac and cheese. I could have choices. I feel a little dizzy, and not from all the cigar smoke, but one thing is clear. This job is about money. I need to care about money. I was thinking more like 28. Mr. Stackman opens his eyes wide in surprise. 28? What makes you think you're worth 28? Or 22 for that matter. I consciously slow my breathing and search for magic words that will make this Harold Stackman choose me. I learn fast and I work hard, I say. <laughs> That's the least of what I expect from an employee. Why do you think personnel thought I could use you? I'm cornered, but not giving up. My smile returns. I'm resourceful. 
To my amazement, he bursts out laughing. Did I say something so incredibly stupid? Really, I've been worried you might be one of those worthless bookworm types. Frankly, Miss Hoffman, I'm having some trouble understanding why you're here. Have you ever heard of Mosley Securities before? You had the biggest ad in Wednesday's newspaper. The biggest ad. Why were you looking at the ads? You had a job. A guy came into the store, put a gun to my face, and I had an epiphany, a wake-up call of sorts. I know what an epiphany is, Miss Hoffman. I went to college too. What exactly was yours? I needed a better job. There are other jobs out there. You could join the circus. Mr. Stackman, everyone in my family is a scientist. I'm the only one among my parents and siblings who doesn't have an MD or a PhD. To them, finance is joining the circus. I love philosophy in school, learning how to think, tackling the big questions. Is there a God? Why is there evil? But I didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated. I forgot to tackle that big question. I had previously worked retail, and so I went back to a store to buy some time. Now I'm ready, really ready to do more. I wish I could tell you I wanted to be a stockbroker ever since I swallowed my first penny. But the truth is, I was robbed at gunpoint and quit my job, and then I saw your ad, and for whatever reason, it grabbed me, and here I am. Mr. Stackman stands up. The interview is apparently over. I need to say something. When do you think you might decide about the position? Hmm. I've decided already. You got the job. How's 25 sound? I laugh. I can't help it. Managed to nod my acceptance. And Mr. Stackman laughs too. This time it's a friendly laugh. Small lines crinkle at his eyes, white teeth flash. The furrows on his forehead disappear. When I came into this room, I thought he was an old man. But now I can see that he's younger than I thought, maybe 50, maybe not even. You're not the only one in the room who makes quick decisions. As soon as I looked at your resume, I knew you had the brains for the job. I needed to see you at the balls. Are you sure you want this? It can get unreasonably crude around here. We're not the bunch of genteel North Shore ladies you're used to working with. I pass on a comment about those genteel customers. He's probably married to one. Instead, I straighten my spine and say, I stared down a robber. I got three older brothers. No rude behavior will unnerve me. Good. I believe it. I'll tell personnel you'll be starting on Monday. Be here at 7 a.m. Come right up to the 18th floor. He pulls a silver case from his breast pocket. It opens with a flick and he extracts his business card and hands it to me. Harold Stackman. Senior Vice President, Institutional Equity Department. Got any questions? I have one question. Now's the time to ask it. Okay, what exactly am I going to do? Mr. Stackman answers without hesitation. You're going to help me make money. Money. It's a trip. (laughs) <laughs> if I had the rights, I'd be totally playing Pink Floyd right now, but I don't have that. But that was Diane Cohn Schneider reading a sample chapter from her debut novel, Andrea Hoffman Goes All In. The pre-order for that is up right now. You can click the link in the show notes. The book comes out August 30th, so make sure you pre-order it right now. The links are in the show notes for uh, the book and everywhere that you can follow Diane. Uh, don't forget to also click that link in the show notes for our podcast friends, affiliate and sponsor Scrivener and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next week when I'm back with a brand new author, a new book, and an all new sample chapter. Take care everybody. We'll talk to you again real real soon. Music